going to be discussing the humerus. We're looking at an anterior view of a left humerus, and we'll talk about how we determine the side of the humerus in a moment. This area right here of the humerus is the proximal end, the shaft or the body of the humerus, and the distal end of the humerus. So the proximal end is important in terms of the shoulder joint. Distal end is important in terms of the elbow joint. The most proximal and medial portion of the proximal area is referred to as the head of the humerus. This is what's going to articulate with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. And as you can see, it's a very large, smooth area of bone. It is considerably more bulbous and larger than the glenoid cavity, which has implications in terms of the mobility of the shoulder joint as well as the stability. Now the pinched in area, just inferior to the articular surface of the head, is referred to as the anatomical neck. Basically the circumference around this entire smooth area of the head. This is the true anatomical neck. We'll talk about another named neck in a moment of the humerus, but this is the true neck. This is the point of attachment of the glenohumeral joint capsule. Now, the other type of neck is referred to as the surgical neck, and it's this thin area right before you get into the shaft of the bone, inferior to the two tubercles in the proximal part of the bone. This is named because this is a site of frequent fracture. It is a weaker portion of the humerus, so in terms of humeral fractures, this is a common area. This has implications in terms of damage to neurovasculature. Around this area, you'll have the axillary nerve encircling the surgical neck, which will affect your deltoid muscle, as well as your anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries. This type of fracture in the surgical neck is especially common in elderly individuals with osteoporosis. All right, back in the proximal view, we're going to talk about the two main tubercles of the humerus. The larger and the more lateral of the two is your greater tubercle. It's going to be opposite to the humeral head. So the greater tubercle is lateral. This is an important insertion site for three of your rotator cuff muscles, your supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. They're all going to insert here. The lesser tubercle, which is going to be the more anterior of the two, and as the name would indicate, smaller, is going to be the insertion site for your subscapularis muscle, so the fourth rotator cuff muscle. So if we'll look a little bit closer here, looking at a lateral view, uh, there's your greater tubercle. Looking at the anterior view again, this is your lesser tubercle. Now, if I were to turn it around and look at a posterior view, and the way I know I'm looking at a posterior view, or the, the, the best way to look at it, is if you're looking at the distal part, you'll have this large, deep olecranon fossa. This is going to articulate with the olecranon of the ulna, important in terms of the elbow joint. So we know we're looking at a posterior view now of the humerus. On the shaft of the humerus, you're going to have a groove, which is about midway down the shaft of the humerus. This is referred to as the radial groove, and it's going to spiral around this posterior surface of the humeral shaft. Your radial nerve, as well as deep brachial vasculature, is going to travel in this area and actually cause the groove in the bone. So if you have a fracture in the midpoint of your humerus, that neurovasculature is in, in danger. Now looking back at an anterior view, often in the lateral portion of the shaft, you're going to have this mounding or building of bone. In some individuals, this will be quite 
substantial in this particular specimen. It's not very significant. But you'll always have some type of mounding of bone here, and this is referred to as your deltoid tuberosity. So a roughened process on the lateral side of the shaft. And as the name would indicate, this is going to be an attachment site for your deltoid muscle. Okay, now we're going to focus on the distal end of the humerus. One of the first things that probably sticks out or is most obvious in this view is what's referred to as the medial epicondyle. Now there's two ways that you know that this is medial. First off, the medial epicondyle is going to be larger and project more than its lateral counterpart. Also, we know that the humeral head is medial, so this epicondyle is going to be medial as well. This is going to serve as the attachment site for your common flexor tendon. So this is that origin for the superficial group of forearm flexors. On the other side, the lateral epicondyle, which is going to be on the same side as your greater tubercle, this is where your common extensor tendon is going to attach. So lateral epicondylitis, also uh, colloquially referred to as tennis elbow, you can have inflammation of this tendon in this region or the periosteum of the bone. So generally with that repetitive use of those superficial extensor muscles. Okay. Now the most distal portion of the bone, you'll see these very smooth articular surfaces. And you're going to have two distinct areas of articular surfaces. The more medial is your trochlea. This is what's going to articulate with the trochlear notch of the ulna. And very important in terms of limiting side-to-side -side movement, so you can get that true hinge joint that you have in the elbow. The more bulbous, more circular, lateral articular surface is referred to as the capitulum. So this is lateral, and it's going to articulate with the head of the radius. 